Blog Talk Radio. And here we go. All right. Welcome back to That Nerd Show. I know you've been missing us, but we're back. We're here. we got lots to talk about. And there is nothing more important than you should be listening to right now than our show. Well, except maybe hockey. It is the uh, hockey. It is the NHL playoffs. But other than that, other than that, you shouldn't be listening to anything else. Only that nerd show. All right, so we got a good, exciting show for you today. Um, I'm one of your hosts, Marcus Blake, and uh, with me as a guest host tonight is Alex Moore. Hello out there, and I'd just like to add that if you happen to have a basketball team that's actually winning in the playoffs, that would be worth watching at some point later on as well. (laughs) But obviously the teams that are playing around here are not doing well, so there's that. Not even paying attention. However, um, while we do not talk (laughs) sports on this um, on this show, we do we will make a quick a quick brief mention of the Dirk Nowitzki uh, documentary, which showcased at the uh, Dallas Film Festival this uh, past week. So, and uh, if you've been wondering where we've been, well, it was the Dallas International Film Festival. Eleven days of craziness, and uh, I'm just now starting to recuperate from all of that. Still haven't finished editing all of our interviews because we did a lot, but we got the most important ones, and we're gonna and uh, the most important one that we got, Mr. John Landis himself, and you can go on to our uh, website that nerdshow dot com, our YouTube page, uh, that nerd show films, or pretty much anything that has that nerd show on it, and see that interview uh, that I got to conduct with John Landis. And all I can say is, yes, the man is awesome, pure awesome. But all right, before we get to everything uh, with the film festival and talk about the movies that you should be seeing, uh, we got a little bit of news to talk about. So we're going to try to zip through this really quick. Well, not too quick, but we're going to get through it and let you know kind of what's going on. Uh, first, if you if you did not know, because we didn't really announce this before the film festival, but uh, that nerd show has a new Facebook page, uh, which we're increasing our audience, and it's basically a page where we do all of our news and posts, and you can go to facebook.com forward slash that nerd show and see all the latest things. Uh, special shout out to David Herring, uh, the nerdfish, who keeps it updated pretty regularly with uh, breaking news items. Um also, uh, as a secret uh, uh, plan, kind of for me, it's also uh, it's it's almost like he's making my news rundown for me personally. So, definitely a special <laughs> shout out for that. <laughs> anyway, uh, the major news item that probably happened, uh, well, no, I shouldn't say probably, but it did happen, and it happened in a very big way, was last Thursday when they officially dropped the Star Wars trailer. Uh, the, the next teaser, a full two minutes of Episode 7, uh, getting to see what was going to go on. And I, I have to applaud J.J. J. Abrams and Kathleen Kennedy and, and, uh, and Disney and everybody for doing this. They didn't wait days after Celebration to drop the trailer online um, and risk having bootleg copies. They literally dropped it at the same time for everybody around the world. So as soon as everybody at Celebration was seeing it live, they dropped it on their YouTube page, and we got to see it. And we didn't get much work done on Thursday, (laughs) not even that night at the film festival doing interviews, because that's all that people could talk about was the trailer and how many times did you watch it. You know, the theories exploded. Uh, We've already got a new catchphrase. We've already got a new catchphrase in the nomenclature. It's, hey, have you seen the new trailer? And everybody knows (laughs) what you're talking about when you say that now. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I like that it has hit that pop culture status. It's, It's not the Star Wars trailer. It's the trailer. As if there is no other good trailers out there, but that is the most important one, which I firmly agree with. Uh, Brendan dropped a very long Nerd Show uh, pay, uh, post on our Facebook page about his theories after seeing the trailer, and everybody should go and check that out, because uh, I think some of them might actually be spot on. But anyway, um, hopefully all of our fans, um, you know, 
have seen this. I know prisoners on death row that have seen this trailer, so you have no excuse not to see this. <laughs> At least a few times. So, um, <laughs> all right, pretty pretty exciting. Um, okay, so major news that uh, came out uh, today. Uh, Fast and Furious 8 has officially been announced. So for all of you wondering what they were going to do after – Seven and would they carry on the franchise uh, despite Paul Walker? The answer is yes, which I think they opened up. At, yeah, April. Um, what, this is like April something or other of 2017. Um, anyway, they did open up that storyline in Fast and Furious Seven that it could continue without Paul Walker. You know, after doing a nice little tribute to him. So there we go. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming we're going to get to see a lot of uh, Mr. Uh, Nobody, um, Kurt Russell. <laughs> so there you go. Um, Daredevil 2, um, or I'm not, I'm sorry, not Daredevil 2. No, Ben Affleck did not reprise the role and make everybody throw up in, in their mouths. Um a second season of Daredevil on Netflix is being greenlit and will probably be out in the next year. Uh, we don't have an official date yet, only because they're not trying to stack all the Defender series on top of each other and trying to space it out. But they did confirm that they will be shooting Daredevil at the same time that they're shooting Jessica Cage. Um, so, or wait, did I just say that right, or Jessica Jones? Anyway, (laughs) well, it could be Jessica Cage, hint, hint, in the comic books. Um, Anyway, not to give anything away. Yeah. So, and if you're asking why you haven't seen our review on it yet, well, we've been at the Dallas Film Festival, so unfortunately, we didn't get to binge watch Daredevil all week long like everybody else did in the world. But we will be getting a review to you uh, here in the next few days. Uh, but, of course, I think personally that it was kind of obvious that Daredevil, uh, that the second season would be green lead. I mean, it was popular even before it actually started. And um, I think that I, I, I just, I don't know why anybody would be surprised that it wasn't going to get a second season. So, but I'm glad that it is. Um, because as I have finally finished it, uh, we need more Daredevil. And we need more Daredevil to make us forget that Ben Affleck was ever Daredevil. So, there you go. Um, What about Jennifer Garner? (laughs) Okay, I will admit... It's a bit more forgivable, I guess, because it's Jennifer Garner, but... Perhaps? Yeah, okay. She was okay in that movie. The electric, the electric, uh, Electra movie, not so much. That no, was no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knows that. <laughs> we yeah. still need a good. We still need a good female super superhero movie. It just hasn't happened yet. We talked about it on the red carpet with somebody. I think uh, may have been uh, may have been one of the interviews on the red carpet. I think with VIFF. It just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, well, and, you know, for those of you that don't know really much about our interviews, um, last year, or from, you know, on the red carpet at the film festival, last year was really our first full year to be able to to do that. And we got some great interviews, but we didn't get as much as we did this year. Uh, but we always ask directors and actors, if they could be in a superhero movie, what would who would they like to play, you know, a villain or a good guy? As a director, what would they, you know, what kind of, film would they like to do uh, or reboot something and we get a lot of interesting actors or or, I mean answers and Mm -hmm. it's funny because we get a lot of people from all over the world who have you know such different wild answers Um, but some of the the, some of the you know females that we did interview uh, have brought that up that we don't have enough strong enough you know female characters and, and everything um, and then we need to have a lot more. And the fact that it's taken so long to even get another Wonder Woman movie or bring her back is, you know, kind of sad. 
Really, the only strong female character that I think is kind of leading the way out of all the superheroes is, you know, Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow. And she's not really yeah, a superhero. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. So, speaking of that, that's my next news item. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Scar- Scarlett Johansson is going to be in Ghost in the Shell. They will start filming early 2016 w- with eye on 2017 for the release of the American version, not animated, Ghost in the Shell film. Um, and we get a lot of mixed reactions on this. Some people are like, oh, she'll be very good. But other people, uh, and it's always the hardcore animation fans, that this is, it doesn't matter how good looking she is, you know, America shouldn't touch this. It's going to be completely ruined. And I'm not an anim- I'm not an anime person myself, so I can't really give a good logical opinion on that. However, I can definitely see their gripes about taking something good and pure, and then into- and then you know Hollywood ruining it, like they've done so many times. The latest Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Just saying. Mm. Just saying. Um. So. There's a little, there's a little bit of uh, you know current news for you. Uh, one quick little thing. Um, oh, two more news items, and then we're going to move on to the film festival. Uh, so for all you Galaxy Quest fans out there, let's yes. not announce this week. Yeah, I think we can all agree that it's one of the greatest movies ever. Uh, but apparently, it's getting a TV show now. Now, I want to <laughs> remind people that while this sounds like a good idea. It has not been confirmed that Alan Rickman or any of the other cast will actually be back for the TV shows. Uh, they probably won't be. So you By automatically... Hammer. Huh? By Grapthar's Hammer. <laughs> By the Sons of Warvant. <laughs> we will you avenge thee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, speaking of that, we did a trivia question uh, a couple of years ago at the Star Trek in the Darkness promo night. And for the big ultimate prize pack, I asked, which movie, uh, what is the, if Live Long and Prosper is the famous saying in Star Trek, what's the famous saying in the Star Trek parody movie and name that movie? And, of course, everybody looked at me kind of confused, but there was one guy in the back of the theater that raised his hand, and I was like, what is it, sir? And he stood up proudly, and he's like, that would be Galaxy Quest. And by Grethar's hammer, by the sons of Warman, I will avenge thee. <laughs> and then, then finally, everybody was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, that I remember that movie now." <laughs> so, <laughs> I like the idea. I've tried to do something with Galaxy Quest um, as a TV show. I think there's a lot of potential there, but I almost feel like you end up ruining it because it's not going to be the original cast which made that movie. So fantastic, you know. Mm-hmm. So, if you could we pick shall one see. person to reprise any of the roles, who would it be? Though, if you could have one, who would it be? Uh, Sam Rockwell, easy. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, I stole the show. It, it's a he stole the show with other characters who were also stealing the show. So that's an impressive feat. Well, here's the thing. I mean that that. It's all great, but the three funniest characters in that movie is Alan Rickman, his character, and of course Sam Rockwell, and then Andrea, you know, past uh, whatever his name is, who's played who played Monk, um, and I forget uh, his name, yes. Alan. Um, yeah, yeah, Tech, Tech Sergeant Chen in, in the show, but yeah, right, right, but uh, <laughs> but Sam Rockwell just kind of stole scenes like he always does. <laughs> So, um, anyway, we'll we'll see what happens with that. All right, one more final little news item, and then I'm going to get to this week's Sign of the Apocalypse. Um, so everybody knows by now that there uh, there's a crowdfunding campaign going on for Super Troopers, the sequel. And I think this is a great idea. Uh, would love to see them, pre, you know, do Super Troopers again. Uh, but Brian Cox dropped a video a couple of days ago <laughs> just being snarky like he always is in his deep Scottish accent, talking about the fact that he had not been asked back yet. However, he had a couple of stipulations. One, he had to have a he had to have a kick-ass 
action fight scene with a bullwhip. <laughs> that was the stipulations on how he would return. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I and he did quickly point out that it does cost a lot of money to get that kick ass action scene with a bullwhip. So people needed to donate to this campaign to make super troopers. Um I have no doubt that that's going to happen. But uh, good for you, Brian Cox. Uh, We definitely want to see you with a bullwhip in a kick-ass action scene. (laughs) I'm getting all antsy and you're pantsy. Anyway. Okay. Uh, This actually has to do with the news item. Uh, I wanted to save this for last as this week's sign of the apocalypse because we haven't done one in a while. Um, Apparently... Yes, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 was greenlit because Hollywood is stupid. And they want to, you know, rape and murder our nerd souls with crappy nerd movies. Um, But I think in the back of their deluded minds, they think that they can kind of make this better by getting, you know, a superior cast and and whatnot. Um, So they cast Tyler Perry (laughs) to be in this movie. So I want to go ahead and... Just say this. I like Tyler Perry. Um, the Medea character is a great character. He's been great in pretty much everything he does. Actually wasn't a bad Alex Cross. Not even Tyler Perry can save your crappy movie. Are you fucking insane? Really? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2? Because the other one wasn't bad enough? You just wanted to throw good money down the drain? There's so many independent film projects out there that are fantastic. And we know this because we were at the inter- the Dallas International Film Festival. So if you're going to just throw money out the door, then I can recommend an entire list of projects that should be funded, should be given distribution deals. Let's let's do that and not Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Okay? It doesn't, at least Consider make, this it doesn't at least make them look like turtles, for instance. It doesn't look like <laughs> turtles anymore. So, <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And that and that is a good argument to make. Um, they are turtles, and we should they should look like turtles. So even even if they were, you know, radiated into talking turtles named after famous Renaissance painters, and they know kung fu. <sighs> anyway, I'm ju- I just I, I I applaud the effort of trying to get Tyler Perry, but not even Tyler Perry, not even Medea can save this drowning ship of a piece of crap movie. So, that's this week's Sign of the Apocalypse. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. All right, so on to the Dallas International Film Festival. Um, As I said before, it was 11 days of craziness. Um, We did not get to see everything because there was was only four of us, and there's 164 films, including shorts. Uh, but we got a lot of great interviews and can recommend uh, a lot of things uh, to you. So we're gonna um, we're going to kind of go down our list of our favorite movies, and I will actually kind of uh, I'll tell you what the uh, the winners were uh, if we saw them and and how it all uh, worked and everything. Um, but before we do that, uh, I do want to get to this. Excuse me. I am drinking beer tonight. Um, <laughs> every every film festival shows a few classic movies, and they like to honor directors and and you know past and fa- and classic movie actresses and or actors and stuff. Um, last year's you know classic movie pick was um, Stagecoach, the movie that made John Wayne famous, uh, and it was great seeing it on the big screen. Well, this year was a particular. Favorite of mine, great classic, and it was the Blues Brothers. And John Landis was in Dallas to accept a – he was a star recipient. Uh, it was really cool. His son Max actually was there on by, uh, on a surprise to present the award to him. Now, if you don't know about Max Landis, he actually wrote the movie Chronicle uh, about the kids who developed superheroes power, uh, superhero powers and, you know, have to learn to live with them and do the right thing. Um had Michael B. Jordan in it, who is, you know, in, currently in the uh, new Fantastic Four movie. Um, so, and as I said, we got a great, great interview talking about uh, the Blues Brothers. 
uh, and how it all came about with John Landis. Uh, some little fun, uh, some fun tidbits about that movie, and you should definitely check our interview out with it. Um, but yes, that was the big classic movie, and he did a Q and A, uh, you know, for the screening. So it was the original 35 millimeter print that they showed at the Texas Theater uh, last Saturday. Uh, the Blues Mobile was there, or a Blues Mobile. Um, lots of us were dressed up as Blues Brothers. It was just, it was the perfect night. Um, so, you know, congratulations to John Landis for that award and, of course, um, for everything that, you know, came about uh, with this. Um, so, anyway, uh, I'm going to go down the list here real quick, and I'm going to kind of read the who won what awards and everything, just in case you haven't um, uh, heard and in case some of you out there haven't actually, you know, gone over to the site. So, um, best short film was Melville. Uh, the best documentary feature uh, was Bat, Bat Kid Begins, The Wish Heard Around the World. And, you know, and if you're a nerd, you should automatically know about the Bat Kid and the city of San Francisco, you know, coming together to give him an adventure. Uh, the best narrative fe- uh, feature uh, was Thunder Broke the Heavens, which we're actually going to talk about here a little bit later. Uh, narrative feature competition, uh, the grand jury prize was the movie Radiator. Uh, special jury prize for cinematography was Some Beast. Uh, special jury prize for ensemble performance, Echoes of War. And uh, the documentary feature grand prize uh, was Barge. Uh, the Texas grand jury prize was for the movie Sacrifice, uh, which we got a great interview with the uh, uh, director and producer of. And um, Special Jury Prize Ensemble Performance, uh, The Love Inside. And for the shorts competition, uh, short grand jury prize was Cast in India, uh, or Student Short Grand Jury Prize. Short grand jury prize went uh, to The Chicken. Uh, Short special jury prize went uh, to One Hit Acquitta. Uh, Special jury prize went to The Face of Ukraine, casting uh, Oksana Bayul. Uh, and then, of course, the animated. Yeah, I didn't even know. <laughs> I didn't even hear about that one, to be honest. I don't even remember interviewing anybody from that film. Oh um, man, just a big interview, Oksana Bayul. That would have been like a childhood dream come true, right there. <laughs> are you, are you like coming out that you're a major figure skater fan? I had. I'm coming out that I had a crush on Oksana Bayul in 1994 <laughs> for Little Hopper. <laughs> I, I, I kind of liked Christina Yamaguchi. I'll admit it. <laughs> yeah, she was and, great, and Ta- too. Yeah, and Tanya Harding might have been crazy, or and still is, but she was kind of cute back in the day. Um, and the animated short grand jury prize goes out to the world of tomorrow, and then, of course, the Silver Heart Award was frame by frame. So there are your uh, prize winners uh, that happened, and... All movies you should uh, definitely check out um, and stuff. Okay, so we're going to jump right into it. And I think we should actually start with uh, Thunder Broke the Heavens. Um, We didn't get, we both had to watch the screener, but uh, we both got a chance to see it and got a great interview with uh, Tim Skousman, uh, the director and writer of the film, and uh, Alexandra Peters, who was the main star and uh, the little star who played her brother in the movie uh gavin howe um i gotta tell you i this was one of the best uh movies at the film festival i was actually very much blown away um by everything in the film and very much blown away by the level of talent that miss peters has so what did you think well i yeah i was certainly impressed by her uh portrayal and uh her effort i think uh I think there was a, a great amount of nurturing and care that went on with the director, and I felt like with Mr. Skousen, we could really see it just when we were on the red carpet and the way he was just conducting himself with the children on the red carpet, and you could just right. see that there was a great, great chemistry between them, almost like a father with his two children, and I think he really created a great atmosphere for the two of them that they could work in and feel comfortable, but then still be able to get the job done, and she really uh, came through. Well, and for those of you that don't know what the film is about, um, it's about two kids who escape uh, their father basically murdering 
their family on Thanksgiving Day uh, and have to be placed in um, a foster home. And it's kind of a brutal home, um, not a very good atmosphere, and they eventually escape and go out and live out in the woods, um, you know, trying to survive and you know, until, you know, uh, the daughter or the the, the character that Miss Peters plays, you know, can't, she can't do it all, you know, and take care of her brother and, and, and whatnot. Um, so she's faced with that circumstances and also faced with some very life-threatening, you know, um, things that happen towards the end of the film. But it's about two kids, you know, trying to maintain their innocence and setting out on their own, but trying to escape the harshness of the world. And especially, you know, with the foster care system who, um, you know, some people are literally just in it for the extra check and they don't really care about these kids, you know, that kind of thing. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is I had a chance just kind of privately to talk with Tanner uh, Beard, who played the foster father in the film, who, you know, well, yeah. he's, as he likes to put it, I'm I'm kind of a bastard in the film, <laughs> and his character is. Um, you know, it it's, Kind of again, it hits upon that issue that we don't that it's. I mean, it's hard enough being in a foster home, but being in one where there isn't any kind of nurturing environment, and you know, you're especially when you're dealing with kids that are coming from traumatic circumstances and stuff like that. How do you, you know, how do you deal with that? Um, and especially for the kids who feel like that the only the choice they can make is to set out on their own and say, we we don't need grown ups. That kind of thing. Um, and one of the things that he actually mentioned, and I did not know this, um, was uh, Alexander Peters is actually from Russia and, you know, has been trained in dance and singing and then music. And in the scenes in the film, you know, where it's actually her playing, you know, guitar and I think she kind of helped write some of those songs and, and, and whatnot um, and everything. But uh, just... I, I, she is someone to look out for in Hollywood. Um, and, of course, she was very nice on the red carpet and and everything. But, yeah, this just a very much an incredible film. Yeah, and I was, uh, I was really uh, happy with the cinematography. I think there were some great opportunities to really uh, give, the, give the scenery a chance to, to play a role in the film. I felt like there was a – I thought that, that was well done as well. Um in parts of the film, but um, overall, um, it was emotive and dramatic, and you know the direction and the nurturing that went on, um, just getting those kids prepared uh, for the film. And I want to say for Tanner Beard, uh, not just with the role he played in the film, but being being as gracious as he was throughout the week on the red carpet and giving us time to speak with him about the film. I thought that he was a swell guy to talk with about the film. Well, yeah. Um, generally, you know, everybody was generally pleasant. I mean, there's, you know, I know that you hear instances sometimes of, you know, people are being rude and just, oh, I don't want to be there, but I've got my contractual obligations and whatnot. Um, you know, we, we, got a, we had a lot of great conversations, not only on the red carpet, but kind of outside uh, you know, in the media lounge and all that when you're you know, when you're hanging out uh, with these people because you know there isn't very very many famous famous stars you know that come and do that. I mean, probably the most the two most famous stars that I think were at the film festival were John Landis and uh, you know Blythe Danner, uh, which of course we have a great opening night interview with her talking about her latest film, but also some of her past projects. Um, I think Chloe uh, was very excited to get to talk to her. About voicing um, the 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 Helen Castle movie, you know, an anime movie that which she's a huge fan of, and mm-hmm. you know, but um, but yeah. Um, so speaking of like cinematography, it's kind of good for bringing that up. But another movie that we have to mention, um, and I really do want to just praise this film. If if you are if you love good old kind of spaghetti westerns. Um, you know, where you're, uh, the landscape almost, you know, serves as a third character. Um, it's gritty and, and funny and, and whatnot. Then Red on Yellow Killafella is the movie for you this year. Uh, and that 
and again, we got you know a great interview with Justin Meeks, who helped, who starred in it, but was also one of the you know was a co-director. And of course, I had a chance to talk with him uh, privately at the Blues Brothers screening. But yeah, that movie that movie was actually really good. Just just the way they shot it, and Texas almost being a villain in itself, bringing these characters down. Um, and you had a lot of biblical imagery and almost revelation end of the world type of times um, once you get to, you know, these characters trying to escape and find their gold and you think they're going to get away. And, um, you know, kind of the point that bad men shouldn't get away, that they will be swallowed up by, you know, their own deeds and, you know, the chickens come home to roost, so to speak. Um, but, yeah, that, that, that whole movie was was really interesting, too. <laughs> Uh, shot in terms, right in terms, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, in terms of entertainment value, I thought that was the film I really enjoyed the most. Um, I think it would have been interesting to actually see it uh, in theater uh, to really get an idea of how the audience was responding because it was getting a lot of praise uh, from the general right. uh, audience. Um, yeah. Um, Actually, Justin kind of made a comment to me uh, when we were talking. I mentioned that we didn't get to see it in a theater, but we did. Uh, you know, we got the screener, and he was like, "Yeah, we've been we were, we're watching to see how many people downloaded or watched it and everything." And it's like, "Well, you you can count a few of us because that was the only <laughs> way we could get to see it." But you know, a lot more people were able. I think we're going back and being able to do that um, afterwards. Um, so um, I hope. I think they were still looking for a distribution deal, um, trying to get it out there more. Um, but, you know, they just – the way that it was put together – again, it to me it is very much reminiscent of the Sergio Leone movies, you know, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly with Clint Eastwood and, and, and stuff. Um, and I, I loved Justin Meeks and his, the characters that he, you know, kind of pl- and the characters that he played. It did very much remind me of um, Eli Wallach <laughs> and, and the Good and Bad and the Ugly. Just that kind of crazy, dirty, grimy Hispanic, you know, criminal that's trying to gun down the stranger. Um, but yeah, it, it, especially if you love stuff shot here in Texas, then it was definitely, you know, right up there. Uh, and speaking of another movie that was shot in Texas, I want to mention this one briefly. Um, Echoes of War, which, you know, won an award for Best Ensemble. It had um, James Baggerdale in it and Ethan Embry, and we got a chance to interview Ethan Embry uh, about the film uh, and William Forsyth and, and stuff. Um, the The story centered around a Civil War, a Confederate Civil War veteran returning to Texas um, and living with his brother-in-law and his niece and nephew, and finding out that a cattle, a cattleman was basically, you know, trying to take over and and steal from them and and everything. So it gets to this kind of family squabble, um, and you also deal with a lot of issues of post-traumatic stress, which you know wasn't really called that back then, um, and standing up for your rights and. You know, can prayer really work? Will God really save you? That kind of thing. Um, and, um, you know, Ethan Embry's character is very much seen as kind of a coward, and I'll just let things be until he's forced to kind of take a stand at the end of the movie. Um, but that was actually pretty incredible, too, and just the performance. And I, I have to applaud James Bagger Dale and very much – not you know very much a heavy thick southern draw, but it kind of, but his character does remind me a lot of John Wayne's character in The Searchers, coming home you know from the war, trying to adjust, knows that he's not a good person, um, and trying to find his own humanity again, um, which you know I think by the end of this film he gets to the point where he knows he's really not going to have that anymore. But he's going to stand up for his family and what he thinks is right, and even if it means he has to go out on a killing spree. Um, hence, you know, the echoes of war, because it's very much relevant as an allegory today. You know, we've got vets returning that it's it's hard to adjust uh, to life and and you know find some kind of normalcy. So. <clears throat> 
definitely, definitely <clears throat> applaud that film uh, for what it is, and, and you know, just great, great acting all around. Especially, I, you know, especially about Ethan Embry. You know, he's our age now, pushing close to forty, and uh, we still like to remember him from his teenage roles of. <clears throat> Uh, you know, at Empire Records and Can't Hardly Wait, and he is so much far removed from that now that he can take on grittier roles and much more of an adult character. And, uh, you know, it's just very, very interesting. So um, so what other movies uh, stood out to you, Alex? Well, um, the first movie that I had the chance to really sit down and watch was a film that you actually uh, got to join me with, and that was uh, This Isn't Funny. And uh, obviously some sort of an ironic title, This Isn't Funny or Is It type of thing. And uh, we had a chance to also talk with the uh, two stars of the film, that being uh, Katie Page and Paul Ashton, playing the parts of Jamie Thompson and uh, Elliot Anderson. And I felt like, uh, there was definitely a chemistry between the two of them, and as it turns out, we, uh, as I found out after the movie was over, they actually are dating each other in real life, so uh, it was clear that there was some advantage to uh, their work in the film as well. But, you know, I have to say that there was uh, some parts of this movie that were very funny that I think uh, everybody in the audience really enjoyed. But, you know, it's a romantic comedy, and you don't necessarily get a lot of romantic comedies at uh, film festivals like this. But right. I was impre- I was impressed with the sound mixing that they were able to do in some of the parts that were a bit more dramatic and serious, and I thought that the comedic part of the film was uh, was excellent. I wasn't sure how I felt about the romantic side of things. You know, it's very hard to kind of strike that balance between making something that's a good romance and something that's also a great comedy, uh, without one kind of taking over the other as being uh, very dominant. And I felt like uh, structurally there were some issues just with the way they sort of put some of the comedic elements in there, even though uh, by themselves that um, were very funny. But um, overall, I thought the cast was solid. I thought everybody gave a great uh, performance. Um, everybody kind of had their chance to, to be funny, and everybody kind of delivered when they needed to. Uh, but at the end of the day... Um, I didn't think the story itself was something too memorable. I just felt like it was a movie that was funny and was enjoyable. Um, So something that I think people could enjoy as a comedy or romance, depending on which they can relate to. But um, as as a hybrid, as being a romantic comedy, I I was uh, not too sure how I felt about it on that as far as just how solid it really was overall. Um, I thought it was very clever. Um, great ensemble cast. I, I don't like romantic comedies to begin with. I mean, unless they're very clever. Like, I, I still think Four Weddings and a Funeral is probably always going to be my favorite. But, you know, <laughs> I like British comedy more than anything else. I mean, I do. I have an ex-girlfriend who will probably never speak to me again, you know, for turning me on to that movie in 1998. But, anyway... Um, you know, it's not always about everybody ending up together at the end of the film. It's about how, you know, real life is and, you know, in the baggage that you bring along. Um, but there is one element of the romantic comedy that I think always has to stand from, you know, screwball comedies of the 30s, 40s, and 50s to now. There has to be that really accidental meet cute between your two characters. And I think it was clever of... You know, she runs nearly runs him over while he's on his bike and then makes fun of him in stand-up comedy later that evening in his ridiculous bicycle hat. Um, the stand-up element of the film and these people that, you know, put forth the craziness in their lives out on stage, which, you know, is a very real thing between comedians. You, The best comedy is always trying to share from your experiences. Um, I thought that was fantastic, you know, um, so, of course, you know, you've set up this, I don't like you, blah, 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 but I'm going to make fun of you on stage, and automatically there is some kind of thing between you. That, But 
you know, again, it's not always about ending up with that person and riding off into the sunset and being all happy and whatnot, especially when you're dealing with a pregnancy scare. It's, you know, it's, it's a, again, you're supposed to come to some kind of resolution, and if you don't end up together, then, you know, what did you learn from it? Does it make you better for the next relationship? Or do you, is it, you know, do you deal with the, what they are, you know, the, the, the cliche of a saying, you know, you have to set them free, to, and then, you know, if they come back, that, then it's meant to be type of deal. Um, but the humor in it was very good. You know, I love the soundtrack. Um, you can definitely tell uh, that the two stars had a lot of chemistry together. Uh, but uh, but the other thing to applaud is the <laughs> um, is all the other side characters, you know, and who they got to be in the film. Anthony right. Lavagia was absolutely hysterical. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that particular role as someone, you know, the, the, the health nut, I smoke pot, and you know, come in, I will give you wheat grass and blah, blah, blah type of person. Um, so, you know, I I don't, you know, it, it's a very, you, you mentioned that's a very clever title. Um, their situation I don't think is meant to be funny, but yet it is. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe it's really looking back and saying, how can you not laugh at it, even though it's kind of tragic and, and stuff, because humor is the best medicine. Um you know, and, and and especially when they're dealing with idiotic parents, you know, as young people and thinking that they're not that they're being irresponsible and not li- you know not living their life the way they should, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I I personally would give it I'd give it a seven out of ten. It's not a great great movie, but it's not a horrible movie either. It's definitely a fun movie and very clever. And how and, and how it's written, um, and I think the two stars. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, be very proud of it, especially the original yeah. material, the you know comedy material that that uh-huh. goes into it. I'll put it to you this way: I would, if ever, I love Judd Apatow. I will always love everything he does. Okay, and I thought Funny People was kind of clever as a movie. Okay, but. I also didn't buy it as much because, you know, here we are with Adam Sandler and, you know, Seth Rogen. And, I, you know, I, I feel like we're in some kind of weird, like, college movie, and it did, didn't live up to – it didn't live up to what I thought it should be, especially from the stand-up. I thought this isn't funny with that element in the movie was way better. So, well, I get Judd Apatow. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think what the, what what helped this movie compared to a movie like that one was that there was just a better flow. Um, the issue I had with Funny People was the fact that it just seemed like there was kind of a break in the story and there's just sort of an interruption, and you go to a completely different story, and then you kind of make your way back at the end. And if there's one thing that worked with having these comedic moments throughout the film, uh, including the stand-up, which I thought, you know, even though it reminded me of Seinfeld, which was absolutely great, um, at the same time, I, I felt like some of it didn't quite make sense, um, just from my point of view, being, I guess, more uh, nitpicky on that. But I think that that <laughs> did sort of create a better flow so that you're getting a balance of seriousness in the story, but also getting a few laps in between right. uh, just to kind of balance it out, even if it is, even if it does feel like it is a bit uh, forced uh, in some way. Um but I, I'm kind of with you as far as the overall rating. I was kind of sitting on about a seven on that one, and it, and I think that overall uh, they they did they did a nice job together uh, with this film, and they were they were they were very genuine about uh, what they had to say about the film as well. I think that they uh, have good expectations uh, for their work, and I think uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they can come up with in the future as well and see if they're going to be able to work together in the future uh, after this movie. Yeah. Um, well, and I think that's kind of the test when you're, you know, kind of Hollywoodish and, you know, your actors and, 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 and how much you work together. Um, I got personally reminded of that today when a friend of mine posted on Facebook that uh, the comedy troupe that I was a part of 10 years ago, and it has now officially been 10 years, and the first videos that we ever did together were <laughs> uploaded online. 
can you believe this was the Sideshow Freaks in 2005? And <laughs> while everybody fought and broke up and, you know, one of them, my comedy writing partner, went off to New York and lived a very vagabond life. <laughs> in fact, a few years ago, I got a funny, I got a call one day. I hadn't heard from him in years, and this was totally him. Hey, man, I'm getting a ride to Dallas. But when I get there, can you give me a ride to Irving? <laughs> like, I haven't spoken to you in four years, man. <laughs> yeah. <I was. laughs> it's touching the chain. Like, yeah, we might have to go and pick some stuff up for me. And like, why are we saying stuff? I know, we, I know, we have to go find your pot dealer. <laughs> I you need to do dude, that. In a, you need to do that in a Lumberg voice from Office Space. It would sound better. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to need you to take me to Irving. Um, yeah, we're going to take a couple of stops on the way, okay? Right. But, you know, my point is I think if you're truly professional, you know, you remain friends no matter what, even if you can't remain a couple. Um, yes. And it's kind of the same thing about every, you know, relationship, oh, you know, how yes. you work together and all that. I mean, that's that's the point, you know. There's too many – there's too much immaturity that goes – into relationships where, you know, people can't be friends anymore and, you know, this and that. And I'm just like, look, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But that doesn't mean you have to hate each other and all that. It doesn't mean that you, you know, can't learn to work with each other and all that, especially on a professional level. And I would absolutely get back together with these guys, um, you know, if I had the time and stuff like that, despite fights and disagreements and, 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 and everything because, you know, we're, because of that professional level of we enjoy working with one another. Um, so, anyway, all right. Uh, I mean, we can talk hours on hours on end <laughs> about movies and stuff, and there's still a lot of different things to, uh, to cover, but we're hitting some of our favorites and, you know, the things that we uh, recommend. Um so real quick before I get to what I think was the best one, what did you think of the Jones family documentary? Well, um, you know, I thought it was an interesting story, um, and I have to say that when we had the roundtable discussion with some of the guys who were in on the filmmaking, they really did a wonderful job of selling that film, and uh, and I, I think that they had something great to sell, and I think the the, the relationship, the unlikely relationship between Michael uh uh, Corcoran and the Jones family, uh, uh, especially Bishop Fred Jones, uh, is a remarkable story. And I think that's uh, really um, true to life that you, you find these people who don't seem to have much in common but are able to sort of find a way to get along with each other. And I think what tied these two guys together was that they're both kind of rebels, you know, in their own field. You know, you have this bishop in, uh, you know, over in, you know here in Texas who is in right. the gospel music scene, but he's got his church family and he's got his, his family at home, and they're kind of telling him you need to do this or you need to do that. And this sort of is an example of he's kind of pulling away at it, you know, and sometimes going against the grain. I think that somebody like uh, uh, Michael Michael Corcoran, who's a, a rock critic, uh, something that he related to, and so I think they just identified that with each other. And it was kind of up to Alan Berg to sort of uh, show that. And I think, for the most part, he was able to uh, sort of show that. Um, if there was anything about the film that I think was lacking, was that just sort of the direction that it went in. And I think for a director of a documentary, it can be a difficult decision because just like when you're making a regular film, uh, you have to sort of angle a story a certain way. Uh, but with this one, you're dealing with real people. And so... Um, it's a very tedious task, but I think there's a lot of thinking that has to go on with that. And you have so much material that you're having to cut and decide which way we're going to go with this because this is all right. real stuff. So we have to decide which uh, side of the story we want to show. And I think right. at the end of the day, they decided they wanted to go with something that was going to be more uplifting. And I don't have any issues with that. I think um, uh, for these people uh, with the, the Jones Family Singers, you want to hope for them that they're going to be able to make something of this and not just in terms of a business and, and financially being stable, but for them as spiritual people, uh, getting their message out and feeling like they've done their job as, uh, as, 
as Christians for um, from their point of view. Right. Uh, you know, I, I agree. Um, after you know, we got to interview the directors and and, mm-hmm. and everything of this film, but we also got to interview the singers, and they actually sang for us. And we'll get that video edited for you so you could hear it. And you know, there's there's what they always called the the two phases of fame. You know, there's always that back in you know people fighting and the ugliness that goes with it and stabbing each other in the back and what you're willing to do to be famous and can you hang on to your soul type of deal. And especially when you're a gospel, which is, I think, you know, an, an interesting allegory. But then, you know, you don't, if you're trying to sell something, you need something to be inspirational to say that you can do it too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can imagine that there's a very big balance on how, on how you do that. But, um but you know, I applaud what these what they're doing. I really do. I applaud where they're going and in, in, in the stardom and and hope that they deal with it well and um and everything. So you know, we'll see with it. Okay, so we got about eight minutes left, and it's going to take about that long to really talk about what I think was probably the best documentary of the film festival. Only for the simple fact that we're nerds, so this is something that's right up our alley. Raiders, the story of the greatest fan film ever made. And if you don't <laughs> know about this film, let me tell you. Uh, a group of guys back in the early 80s, when they were kids, decided to do a shot-for-shot shot remake of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And they did it over the course of seven summers. They got high school friends, and and they did it from the time they were like in you know, sixth grade to the time they, you know, when they graduated high school. And, uh, you know, this is back on like a, you know, not a very good camera compared to today. So, you know, the quality of their film is not that good. But the pure unabashed love they had for Raiders of the Lost Ark and everything they put into it with practical effects to the point of, I'm going to throw a flame retardant, I'm going to put a flame retardant jacket on some guy and throw gasoline on it to set him on fire. (laughs) to show the bar scene in the movie, which they did. And you're like, how are these kids not killing, you know, how did they not kill themselves? Um, so, of course, you know, if you know the story that they, they somebody, Eric, uh, who was the director and played Belloc, let someone copy his VHS copy, and then it would became this underground cult hit because copies kept being made <laughs> from his. <laughs> and it kept getting around to where Eli Roth, got a copy of it when he was in film school in New York. And then, of course, it ended up in Harry Knowles at Ain't It Cool News, and, you know, they've done some screenings of this fan film. Well, they they got – the only scene they didn't do was the airplane scene because they couldn't build an airplane, and they didn't know how to get that done. Well, Tim Skousman um, also did this film, uh, the documentary, and it was about how they came to make the film – everything that led up to it becoming cult status to the fact that Steven Spielberg even saw it and was inspired and they got to meet Steven Spielberg too. We want to shoot this final scene. And they raised $46,000 to shoot that scene. They built a Pratt, they built an, air, an actual airplane while it was more professionally done this time around and the quality is a lot better compared to what it is. They got everything done. They even got, some of their old high school friends back together to play parts, including the girl that they had a crush on in school who played Marion. And she, she came back. Um, so it was kind of them doing the, everything they went through to get this scene done for their final cut of the film and trying to live their dream and, and everything that had transpired with what these kids did, you know, just, Hey, we have a camera. We love this movie. Let's spend our summers shooting this movie. <laughs> and, you know, where their lives went afterwards. So I'm going to tell you, for every filmmaker that's out there, and including, like, us trying to do our documentary about Star Wars, this was inspiring. And I'm glad these guys got to do that final scene to the point that somebody nearly died <laughs> on the set trying to blow up the airplane, the pyro guy. Yeah, and they got all that on camera and didn't know what was going on. And 
and everything. But it's just pure, unabashed love for something. And, I mean, it's it's it, it's a nerd inspiration. And I hope that we get to see another film by Eric as, you know, he gets to fulfill his dream one day of actually directing a film instead of, you know, just a fan film. Um, and for everybody out there, if you want to get a copy of it, I mean, I think you can probably download the fan film by now on Torrance. It gets been copied so many times, I'm sure it's been uploaded. But if you want to get a copy of it, including the final scene that they did uh, last year, you can actually go to their website, uh, Raiders the Adaptation, which is what the film is called, make a small donation. Uh, it has to be a donation. They can't make any profits from it, but they'll actually send you a copy of it, uh, the fan film and the final scene. So... That was my pick for the best documentary of of the thing. And we, we, when we did the screening, we were we were doing the screening with other filmmakers, and I mean, just I, <laughs> people were all in an uproar. I mean, just excited, and if nothing else, for like, there's no way these kids sur- should have survived. And of course, it's also a testament to the '80s where you didn't have to worry about kids as much you know maybe they maybe parents should have worried about them because you know they came pretty close to really seriously injuring themselves but but you know you you could you couldn't do something like that nowadays without people getting in trouble only the 80s because do i think that you could shoot a, a fan film like that and and get away with it so. And I think I think that's something that's really missing now because these create great stories, and it kind of makes you wonder: Are we going to have stories like that in the coming years? And right, you know, maybe there's some stuff going on that we just don't know about, and it'll pop up later, you know, somewhere down the road. Yeah, maybe we we will be at a film festival and we'll get to interview somebody like we did this, and you know, here mm-hmm. is our film. Um, but we we got a great interview with Tim Skousman about this. Um, he actually came and found us personally to do an interview because we originally wanted to do it on the red carpet while we were talking about Thunder Broke the Heavens. Um, and I do feel kind of bad, really bad now, after seeing Thunder Broke the Heavens because at the time we hadn't seen it. And I was like, yeah, I'm sure that's a good movie, but we want to talk about Raiders. And now I was like, wow, <laughs> Thunder Broke the Heavens was a fantastic movie. <laughs> we should talk about this more. But... No, I mean, it, I know the Bat Kid documentary, it, it's phenomenal, deserves to win and, and all of that for what people did for this kid to have an adventure. Absolutely. But but in my mind, Raiders is the best just because of what these kids did, and they're still kids at heart. And the best line, the best line came from interviewing Eric's uh, son. My... <laughs> Steven Spielberg made Raiders of the Lost Ark for $18 million. My dad did it on his allowance. <laughs> so, which just... And it just sums everything up. So, um, We don't have time to cover every film, but we wanted to hit some of our favorites and kind of do a roundup of the things that really st- stuck out for us. Uh, i got about 90 seconds left. So, uh, right. But... I do go check out the Dallas Film Festival website, look up the movies, uh, keep watch about, you know, where they're going to end up because you may not actually see some of them um, in theaters until next year. Uh, There's some from last year that are just now ending up in theaters. But as we get our interviews up, check them out. Let the filmmakers tell you about their film and why you should see it because there's a lot of great things that came out of the film festival this year and lots of things to uh, to look out for, um, and I think a lot of great filmmakers that you that people should be paying attention to, like Alexandra Peters, so Tanner Beard, uh, Justin Meeks. You know, getting to meet these people was a great pleasure, uh, just as much of a pleasure as getting to you know chat with John Landis and everything because they're doing their passions, and that's why that's what we love at that nerd show. So. Uh, we'll be back next week uh, with a artificial intelligence theme show, and then we're gonna, and then that's when we'll talk more in depth about uh, Ex Machina. Uh, but next week is our promo night where we will see Avengers two in the theater, and we'll be at Cinemark Legacy next Thursday night, and we hope to see 
people in Dallas out there uh, watching the movie with us, dressed up in costume, and we'll be doing trivia and giving <laughs> away prizes. So that's it. That's our show, and we got to go. So we are going to be out of here. Say goodbye. Live long and prosper. Ha, ha, ha.